Uh, I'm Carrie Nordland. I'm the Assistant Dean of Undergraduate Programs from the Division of Pre-College and Undergraduate Programs, and I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I'm also a lecturer here at the Watson Institute, soon to be school. Uh, we have a really esteemed group of panelists this afternoon, and uh, I want to introduce them. But uh, just a couple notes before we get started, just uh, following Ellie's lead here, which is that we are um, uh, very clear to follow Brown's political activity policy, which states that we cannot hold a partisan electoral event and all speakers are expected to be nonpartisan and cannot endorse candidates. The goal of this panel is, of course, to um, to give us more information, to educate us. Um, and to really provide uh, and engage in a thoughtful discussion about this uh, election and the potential, potential impact that it will have on our climate. So with that, I would also like to acknowledge all of those who are in the path of Hurricane Milton and those who were lost and are still suffering due to Hurricane Helene. And we wish them very well, especially Milton, which is really gathering a lot of speed in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, to our esteemed panelists this afternoon, uh, Kim Cobb, Director of the Institute at Brown for Environment and Society, also Professor of Environment and Society, Earth, Environmental and Planetary Sciences. Uh, Chris Ray, Assistant Professor of Sociology and International Public Affairs and also at the Climate Solutions Lab. And Stephanie Friedhoff, Co-Founder and Co-Director of the Information Futures Lab, Professor of Practice and Senior Director of Strategy and Innovation at the School of Public Health. Welcome panelists. So to get started, I'm going to ask each of the panel members to do a very brief introduction of their research and their expertise. Uh, I have a few questions then queued up, and then we'll pass it to the audience. And just to be sure that you use the microphone when you ask your question, and also to just make sure your question is a question as well. We have an hour. There's a lot to cover. We want to make sure we get in everyone's, uh, everyone's questions. So um, I'll start with uh, Professor Cobb. Hey, great. Yeah, thanks so much. And I want to thank every, everybody for being here today. And I'm really excited to hear from the audience about what's top of mind for you, um, which is uh, just as important as what we have to say up here, I believe, as well. So hopefully we can get to that. Um, I guess by way of introduction, I'm a physical climate scientist. So um, I was lead author on the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Assessment Report. It was released in 2021. And I guess just um, reflecting the comment, the opening comments about Hurricanes Helene and Milton, um, some of the important work that was done in that assessment report um, was foundational physical links between uh, fossil fuel emissions and, and global warming on the one hand and a suite of climate extremes on the other, really for the first time sharpening our focus on that issue, including the issue of tropical storms, cyclones and hurricanes and the role that rising ocean temperatures and a warming atmosphere were playing in worsening those kinds of climate extremes. And so, you know, as a physical climate scientist, um, I've been doing some work on, on extremes in a in the systems level context, thinking about how we could mobilize our kind of newfound or new awakening of that scientific body of work and mobilize that into climate solutions more broadly. And I would call that climate action more broadly. And so a lot of my comments today are, in fact, going to focus on um, what the science, uh, how we can address the science, understand the science at a deeper level, but also what it means to um, to have science in the public sphere. And we can look at the headlines today and understand the full breadth of what that might mean to have science discourse in the public sphere as, as we are witnessing in real time today um, and tomorrow will end for the last week, of course, but also thinking about um, what it means for the solutions making landscape and uh, the role that policymaking has, the role that research has um, in thinking about the next generation of climate action at the local, state, and federal levels. And so that's something of, I hope we can dive into more, but that's just anchoring a little bit about my expertise and, and issues that are top of mind for me on this um, very important day in, in climate change history. Um. Okay, well, let me just um, echo what Kim said in that I'm thrilled that you're all here um, and it's a privilege to be among this group and to share my own thoughts, but I'm really most interested in having a dialogue with all of you. And so um, I hope I hope we can get to that and that that's the most fruitful part of our discussion. Um, I am a sociologist by training, I'm an environmental sociologist. I come to, soci to, to questions of climate and environment by way of... Um, uh, environmental, political, organizational, and economic sociology. And so um, what that means essentially is thinking about how 
questions of climate, climate politics, uh, attempts to solve problems related to the challenges that climate change poses and so on and so forth, um, are shaped by not just sort of individual preferences and um, uh, nor just sort of the physical facts on the ground, but how social institutions, cultural ideas, um, politics writ large shape those beliefs, right? So um, I tend to think a lot about how larger scale institutions, historical trajectories, things like this shape the politics that we all see playing out on the ground, right? Um, so um, not to say that I have a monopoly on expertise on how those things work. They're obviously far more complicated than I or any of us probably can actually pinpoint. Um, but that is how I approach the question. And so I, I, um, I hope that I can share some of that perspective with you today and help situate questions of both immediate politics and also natural science in the context of sort of, um, of social institutions and politics on a larger scale. Thank you both. Um, and thank you all, as has been said, for being here uh, with us today. I'll maybe be brief so we can get to your questions. Um, a professor of the practice at the School of Public Health, and I'm a longtime journalist by training. And I spent a good amount of time of my career covering the impacts of climate change even before we started officially calling it climate change in our news coverage. So let's go back to the early 1990s on that one. Um, and I've had a chance to witness how our narratives have changed over time and how science, and I'll talk a bit more about our re research in a second, um, but we've been on this long trajectory of understanding climate change itself and how it impacts us, but also collective sense-making. Um, how, how are we thinking about this? Um, I now have the opportunity here at Brown um, uh, to help run the Information Futures Lab where we think about those questions. Uh, our information ecosystems have changed tremendously. Where we get our information and uh, what type of information we get uh, has changed. We all have very different information diets. What you read today uh, in terms of news about the election is very different from what I read today. I'm, I'm pretty sure of that. And those are the types of connections that we study and then we try to understand how do people make sense of all of this. So I spent my time as a practitioner really connecting people with information so they have choices. That's sort of my mantra. Um, at the same time, what kind of information? What is the quality of information? Um, and, you know, what is the role increasingly of false or misleading information in all of this? So um, just to get us started, I'll introduce like one research project that we, we just collect, um, presented at Climate Week. If we all uh, collectively think for a second um, about what is the main priority right now of the American people as we're thinking about the election. Uh, when you look at the surveys, people will talk about the economy is number one, right? Jobs, uh, rising prices, uh, up on two or three, depending on, on the survey, comes health. Most access to health, healthcare cost, all those types of things. Where does the environment show up in and climate change and, and the things we're going to talk about today? Eight, ten. I saw one today from Pew that was thirteen. It's just an evade, sort of on a different level in in terms of people's priorities. Then the question is, if we can connect climate change to health. That is a way into people's heart, right? That is a way into how people are impacted by climate change concretely uh, through their health. Uh, we looked at the content on TikTok, uh, YouTube, Facebook, X, formerly Twitter, all the social media platforms, as well as news headlines to understand. So how often in our discourse are we making the connection between climate and health? How are we using this like great equalizer of health in our information ecosystems and spaces right now to make that connection. Any guesses? What's the percentage of all the content that either mentions climate change, climate crisis, or global warming that touches on health in any which way? Two percent. If you've seen the research, don't say anything, obviously. So we have a two percent guess here. What, what are other guesses? Nobody wants to be more optimistic. Okay, it's three percent. <laughs> 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 we're at brown, so <laughs> um, so by and large, we're not using, uh, uh, and we looked at this content more closely to understand, so then when we are communicating about climate and health, how are we doing this? Uh, the, the 
most often used technique by which we make this connection is doom and gloom. So uh, we're providing mostly negative information. We're not providing solutions. We're not doing a lot of storytelling. Um, and this is the way in which the, this type of research can help us understand how we need to change, how we communicate and how we talk about uh, both climate change and how it impacts people to get larger buy-in, to get more populations to be interested. Um, and that's the type of work that, that we do at the lab. Thank you. Well, to get things started, I'm going to ask you all a broad question. And that is, from your point of view, what has been the role of climate change, climate policy in the presidential discourse so far in this election? So let's start with you, Professor Cobb. I was going to start with Chris. Do you want to go first? <laughs> Shall I go? Um, well, I think, I mean, if you're sitting in this room um, right now, you probably know that it, the answer is minimally, right? Um, there's been a shockingly low level of discourse, I think, just as an, a matter of empirical fact, in the American election, this presidential election cycle. And that is, that is interesting um, relative to, to how the, 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 the size of the problem and the, and the level of the um, challenges that we face. And so um, to the extent that that is that that's what we observe. The question is why, and I don't have, I think, a monopoly and an answer uh, to to that. But I think that there's two. There are two at least parallel things that we need to think about carefully to try to understand that phenomenon, and then what those what those what the sort of um, implications are of those patterns. So the first is is um, a on the Republican side, on the Trump side specifically, sort of. A, 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 a sort of a soft denialism, if you want, or um, or or just outright misinformation, right? So that's one dynamic that's playing out on that in in that political spectrum or that side of the sort of political debate. And on the on the Democratic side, there's basically just a, a l very l minimal engagement at all, right? Not misinformation or disinformation so much as just skirting the issue. It comes up occasionally, um, but it has certainly not been a central campaign plank that the Harris Waltz campaign or before that, that the Biden campaign are trying to use to win the election. That I can only understand as a strategic point, a, a strategic calculus that they think will help them win. And the question that I have actually for all of you that I'd like to get into later is whether or not we think that's the right political calculus. At Brown, I strongly suspect it's wrong. <laughs> at, an, at the national scale, I'm less certain. Um, and so the question, and then the question becomes, what will happen if one of the other candidate wins, given the patterns of discourse that we've seen? So I don't want to take too much time now, but I think those two dynamics are quite different. And the question of, of, in particular, on sort of the Democratic leaning side, what that implies about future climate policy, I think is a really important. One. So I'll back to you, Kim. Or do you want? To I just kind of, you know, res kind of think about leaping off from your comments around the context for the discourse to date and actually how that might change in the next few weeks. We'll see, right? Um, the Biden administration is being challenged on its response to these national level disasters. There's all kinds of rhetoric right now about effectiveness, lack of effectiveness, whether FEMA is positioned well or not. And we may say some of those things surface, some of these issues going forward. Um, but I, I think that you know, I would add on to what you were saying around question marks in the air around the the level of discourse and the frequency of discourse to this point, And I would call some of this like October surprise land that we're moving through right now um, is really around the the lack of leaning into climate resilience as a uh, an important aspect of climate action and climate readiness and and um, kind of policy making. And um, there's there's been a hyper focus historically on decarbonization as the climate problem and the climate solution. Um, but, you know, these hurricanes are reminding us very clearly as if we didn't need reminders from past years, record topping climate related disasters that that the resilience narrative and the work of resilience um, needs to be centered in the discourse around climate at, at every level, including at the national political discourse, to the extent that that might um, uh, depolarize, who knows, but it certainly can't hurt, I believe, to think about that as a uh, opportunity for bipartisan engagement and perhaps surfacing uh, more opportunities to um, talk about climate that do don't land in highly politicized spaces where you make strategic decisions about 
uh, muzzling ourselves around climate discourse. Good thing. Okay. <laughs> Thinking about the information ecosystem perspective on all of this, I think uh, there are a couple answers in how I started out, which is that um, for a long time there was the climate change was a distant threat. It was perceived and communicated as that, and we struggled to make it real and um, uh, find narratives that people can relate to. Um, we We've touched a bit on, on mis- and disinformation, so let's just walk briefly through what do we mean by that. Um, misinformation is misleading information that is out there, but it is shared uh, by the, the person who shares it, not necessarily knowing that it is false information. Disinformation is uh, shared with intent uh, and to confuse people for all kinds of motivations. We've seen a lot of intentional disinformation in the climate space. Uh, Long before we even created this, you know, typology of mis- and disinformation, lying about the climate is, is part of a long history of business-driven interests uh, when the science con contradicts the business model. So that's just important as a backdrop on, on all of this that the general public over the past 30 years has been confused about these issues because it's been in an information war of its own around climate change and its impact. And that has sort of been then... Um, uh, Amplified is now amplified uh, on in our you know per, la largely participatory networked information ecosystems. So what that means is that right now after Ellen, uh, we're seeing you know content uh, accusing FEMA workers of uh, 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 taking away resources from the people who are impacted by the hurricane, uh, and that militias need to come out and sort of create a law and order uh, in the land. Uh, as people are obviously suffering and as um, meteorologists are, are crying uh, uh, on live TV because after what they just saw with the land, they're seeing how Milton has, you know, become a Category 5 storm. All of this sort of la happening live in our information ecospaces right now um, uh, in, in, in which people are trying continuously to, to make sense of what's going on here. What is really important to understand is that in spite of like millions of dollars of investment in confusing people about climate change, people by and large no longer ask the question, is this real or not? Like the, in, the, mis the disinformation effort has really lost that game. And the climate disinformation in the, in the context of which has really changed from concept of uh, it is not real and it's not caused by humans to... Uh, the science is really uncertain and we don't quite know and all the solutions don't work. So um, uh, you want to watch out for that type of content that tries to confuse people. Why is this important in the context of the election? Because in general, elections or topics are driven by what politicians think people care about in their communities. So I'll go back to that point about how we have not connected climate change well enough yet with people's everyday lives in which they have jobs to do, which is get through the workday, you know, get the kids to school and back. Uh, how are we integrating the, these really important things that have consequences into people's lives? I feel like that is a core challenge that we haven't addressed, and that's why that isn't an issue in the election. So this is actually a, a nice a set of right, the second question, which is what should we keep in mind as we are reading and listening um, and taking, consuming election information. So what are, what should we keep in mind, especially when it comes to, uh, to climate policy? So for example, elect, um, electric vehicles, key talking point around jobs, the economy, what, you know, battery, uh, where battery plants are being built, especially in the, in the swing states. So what should we be keeping in mind as consumers of news as we sort of take in all of this um, and think about the as it, as it relates to climate policy? Pastor Fina, maybe we'll start with you. Well, first of all is don't get your facts from debates. <laughs> <laughs> Do the reading before or after and then see how the candidates, you know, sort of compare to what you're learning and consult diverse sources. Um, it's really important to understand that we often think the other side is in a bubble, but we're also in a bubble. And polarization happens because there's that hardening and not seeing the other side. So, so part of our research uh, that we just did on this climate 
uh, uh, communications and climate and health communications ecosystem is that there was almost no conservative framings. Whatever climate and health were discussed, we didn't talk about freedom. We didn't talk about let's get our summers back, right? We didn't use any of the types of framings that speak to an important electorate and an important part of society. Why? But this has got to do with the bias that we have in our own minds of like, who can we reach and who can we not reach? So that part about being being aware of, of our own bubbles and in our information diet, reaching out to the sources that we wouldn't otherwise uh, consult, I think is really important. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor Ray. Um, right. So... Um... A quick point about the, the 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 trajectory of understanding of climate in the public in the American mind, if you will, whatever that means. Um, the so the Yale program on climate change communication is a wonderful authoritative, you know, relatively authoritative source on this. I I suggest that you, if you don't know it already, that you consult it and look at some of the data there. And the the long term trajectory in the American context is depressing on the global scale, um, in the sense that the U.S. has been a lagger. It, it continues to be a laggard on climate action and climate belief and and skepticism remains stronger here than in many other places. But the 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 optimistic point is that that has changed tremendously over time, that the dis the sort of denialism de debate has indeed sort of lost ground and the the rhetoric has shifted to to, as I said before, sort of a soft denialism in the form of solutions don't work, they're not appropriate, and so on, which is very different than climate change is not a thing, right? That's on some level important progress. And just to give you a number, the 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 ratio of Americans in um, sort of the public who who are concerned and believe in climate change versus those who do not is five to one, right? Seventy percent do, thirteen percent do not. That's an overwhelming majority, right, of people who are concerned about the issue. That's that's really important for making political pros progress and and um, building coalitions to push policy solutions forward and things like this. That being said, so the one thing that I would say is that as you think about things like polarization and levels of knowledge and understanding and so on and so forth, just as national polls for presidential candidates don't mean a whole lot because of the way that votes are filtered through the Electoral College, we need to situate those, that, those understandings in the particular institutional and political contexts that they um, arise within or that they live within. And so that the distribution of those beliefs across across states and political jurisdictions and so on and so forth and among constituencies that do or don't have political power is really what matters for translating beliefs into action on a national scale. Um, so I would say we need to think not just about aggregate numbers, although the story is encouraging, but how the numbers map onto the political terrain that we inhabit. I'll just pile on with one more note of Picking up on the EV um, piece here, I, I can't believe we haven't mentioned the Inflation Reduction Act yet, but um, that's a historic piece of legislation that was passed um, several years ago by the Biden administration and a bipartisan coalition in Congress, of course. And um, part of what I think is important to keep in mind right now is that much like climate change is a multi-decade ramp, only now we are seeing some of those consequences and spikes you know, reach out and bite us on a more regular basis. I think it's equally important to remember that the investments that were made in the Inflation Reduction Act are 10-year investments that have only just begun. And in many cases, some of the talking points that you're very likely to hear um, are somewhat outdated. Um, some of them in, on the climate change physical side, right? Like maybe this isn't as serious or this isn't tied to climate change, um, but, but also on the solution side. And I think that's where we're hearing some of these pitched uh, battles in the partisan landscape. Um, but the failure to recognize that whatever data we do have, which is scant and early in terms of the outcomes from the Inflation Reduction Act, are pretty overwhelmingly positive in terms of the impacts that we're seeing on the ground with the private sector leaning in, um, taking advantage of, of government subsidies and incentives to invest in our clean energy economy. Um, where those jobs are falling is where we had hoped they would fall across the Midwest and the southern United States. Um, the investments in our economy are returning, you know, that's again, this key metric, you know, what is the ROI on those investments? Um, they are so far quite positive in terms of stimulating, especially um, solar batteries, EV sectors um, to date. Those are the fast moving pieces of this. Um, but the other ones are slower moving. So some of the ones I wanted to flag that are not yet really giving ROI 
that I think are critically important come back to the resilience investments from the Inflation Reduction Act. So keep that in mind. These were historic investments, not just in clean energy, but in resilience. And so those take a much longer time to come fruition. It's much harder to measure ROI. But again, as we think about the landscape for um, talking points and investments in our in our stable climate future, um, we're thinking about both of those rungs and that historic piece of legislation. So um, just try to stay grounded in the recent data um, about the impacts that that's having and where those funds are landing, because I think that that's a critical piece that will be uh, measured over time with respect to um, the, where the next administration is going to pick up and what they're intending to do with that piece of investment. Thank you. Let me turn to the audience. Questions for the panelists. Let's meet with panelists. I think there are a couple of right here, Katie. Should I take that step? And if it's to a specific panelist, please let us know, or if it's for the whole panel. Hi, I guess I had a question for like the whole panel. Um, I'm taking an environmental science class this semester, and we're kind of talking about whether like um, everyone needs to be kind of included and be on board with like certain policies, especially concerning the environment, because there's kind of this like we know best idea within like environmental scientists and environmental I guess like policy that like, you know, not everyone has to understand or even be on board with like some of the things that we'd like to implement. Um, do you think that's true or is that like maybe damaging overall to like specifically American society? Because there are a lot of people that at this point don't really understand how important like climate policy is. Do you think they need to be on board or should they be on board for like I don't know, just a more cohesive society that is cares more about the environment. Question. I'll take a, a quick stab. Um, I think that part of the reason why we find ourselves where we do is because there's some kind of implicit litmus test out there that says, you know, do you believe in climate change? Yes, no. If you do, you know, we can work together. And if you don't, we can't work together. And, you know, that's not explicitly stated, but that is why we have some of the log jams at many levels of society uh, on, on the climate action, right? And so um, I spent 18 years in Georgia. So um, in that case, that was um, crippling to, to forward action on climate in a state like Georgia, that kind of implicit litmus test of, of tribalism. Um, and so what I found working with policymakers in Georgia, trying to translate scientific knowledge and advanced technologies to, to resilience on the ground, um, was that ultimately um, there, we all share the same common goals, which is we want to have our communities safe. We want to have our economies thriving. Um, we want to advance our, our public health. Um, we want to think about our national security. Those are shared, um, shared goals that all Americans share. And so as we think about the prospect for, for climate action, and we're thinking about the deeply important role of, of more conservative jurisdictions, um, we can think about the, the road forward as one where we are explicitly doing away with that kind of litmus test and leaning into the many, many benefits of acting on climate, right? Better, better health, better, um, you know, cleaner air, um, better jobs, better economy, um, securing our national security for the next 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. Um, so those are the places where we can connect the dots um, if we can kind of lean into those spaces, very much what Stephanie was saying before. Yeah, and, and just to follow up on that, I love the question. Um, and as as you said, we, we so often, especially elections, drive out binaries, mm -hmm. right? EVs are good or bad. Um, uh, that's not the way we should think about any of this, obviously, and we don't by and large. It's just, you know, how the like this morphed discourse in an election works uh, to drive people into a corner. Um, so there's a nuanced answer to your question, and it starts with, the we know best, uh, you know, uh, are, are we talking about we know best what the science says, so you should just follow our advice? Or does everybody need to understand the details of how climate change works in order to act, right? The answer is different to these two questions. Um, and what's important here is that we understand how the pandemic has changed this conversation also with respect to how the public engages with science. Because the the question of we know best is related to the deficit model by which scientists for a long time have communicated in a way that, that says, 
I know the science. I studied it. I'm going to grace you with the science. You know, so you better believe it or you're stupid. Right. That's, however, not how society works or culture works or how we engage as human beings. And certainly nobody you know, sort of wants to be at the party and stand there next to the person who's just uttering facts and says, I know it all. Right. So um, uh, when science communicates with and engages in the public, we often forget our basic manners even. And there's a large conversation that is happening right now around how the pandemic has just impacted and then this is transitioning and has long transition to climate change, that people don't want to be ruled by experts. Right. Wear the masks because the science says wear the mask. Where's the conversation about why we're wearing the masks? So I think everything you just said was was really insightful around what are our shared values? Why does it matter? Not everybody needs to understand exactly like the the at the as you know physics level how how climate change works in order to understand, oh wait, these storms are getting stronger. That's something I can understand. And I see that my community is now flooded because there was also rain before the storm that's unusual. And together, these two things make create a really messy situation. So um, science needs to be culturally authorized through the type of discourse and conversations that we have with each other. And insisting that the science just knows that we need to act on it is the wrong way to make policy. Can I just add one, one quick thing? Not to spend too much time on this question, but it's a fantastic question. Um, and I, I just want to use the Inflation Reduction Act as an example to think with about the context of your question slightly more concretely. So that bill passed with some bipartisan support in the House, but on a razor thin edge in the Senate. Absolutely on partisan lines, right? Basically 50-50. Um, so it was not, there was not bipartisan consensus and it was sort of a real politic. We have the votes. We're going to push it through. It's happening when they finally, when Democrats were finally able to sort of appease Manchin and West Virginia, so on and so forth. But it, they got it through, right? Yeah. yeah. After the legislation is passed, the investments that Kim was just talking about start to be made across the country. And that changes the politics, right? As those projects and investments start to create jobs and opportunities and and even shift people's experiences of for example a hurricane that that um come ravages the community that they're in or, or what have you now but also in 10 years right after resilience infrastructure has been put in place that makes a community more um better able to withstand the impacts of climate change whatever they may be in that particular place right so there's a there's a complicated interaction between being able to get something done with a, a small majority and then the political outfall of that, which in the IRA, in the case of the Inflation Reduction Act, might be to build political support for action on climate. But you could imagine other pieces of legislation which would have the opposite effect and might drive backlash. So I would just say that there is something to think about in terms of how um, sort of using expertise, getting things done when you have an opportunity can be one strategy. And then what happens next depends on how that policy or that action um, changes people's lives on some level moving forward. Yeah. Well, so you mentioned earlier that, um, you know, climate generally is way down on the radar screen in terms of national priorities for elections and politics. Um, I've noticed, however, this cycle that at least across Rhode Island's 39 cities and towns, it, it's a much higher priority for local candidates. And climate resiliency is explicitly mentioned by a number of folks as a key priority. And I just wondered if, if that's a local Rhode Island phenomenon or if you see that trending across, especially in other places where climate is having a particular impact, whether it's wildfires or uh, sea change, sea level change, or flooding, or the other, you know, drought, the, the other areas where, um, you know, folks are seeing that direct impact. I feel like people are looking at me as a poli as the policy person on the panel. And I have to say, <laughs> I have to say that I don't know the answer to the question. Um, my intuition, though, is that um, in, so first of all, that Politics has nationalized over the last few decades, meaning that the sort of the discourse at the national level increasingly structures local politics um, and drives polarization and so on and so forth. Um, but that is not, in you know, that is not the only story. And local politicians are often more free to talk about things in, in sort of more 
you might say technocratic or or perhaps just sort of like bread and butter dinner table type issues that matter for people's daily lives and climate resilience and mitigation are both among those things. And so I think that there's some level of political freedom at the local level that enables local politicians to do that. And regardless of what you think about um, climate change and as it relates to Republicans and Democrats on the national stage, you might have experiences about extreme weather events or um, basically just your own relationship to the weather and the changing climate where you live. And when a local politician talks about addressing those issues directly, not encoded through the politics of national discourse, you're you're apt actually to be quite receptive to those interventions. I'll just add one more thing back to the Inflation Reduction Act. Again, um, via the the Yale Project on Climate Change Communication, um, the, the Inflation Reduction Act is not well known by most Americans. I think it's around a third or so of the public have heard of it and have some sense of it. But when it's described, I think in sort of, again, technocratic terms, large majorities and enormous majorities of liberal leaning people support it and surprising majorities of conservative people also support it up to 30 around. I think it is 30 percent of conservative Republicans are in favor of the provisions of the bill when described to them. Right. So I think that's an example of the kind of thing you're, you're talking about. And maybe just one quick follow up on that. Um, we have run a, a network of state health departments at the School of Public Health. And we just started a, a dedicated um, climate and health network. So state health leaders are coming together every week to discuss what's going on. And just using that as a data point, I can tell you that the the network is called the Extreme Weather Action Network for a reason. And that's right. The answer to your question is to vastly different across geographies. So in Chicago, climate justice plays a big role. And you will find much more uh, that impacting uh, an election cycle much more than in in other parts of the country where it's not even wise for public servants to use the, the language. Are there questions? Are there questions? Mm-hmm. Anybody over here? Well, I have, a, I have uh, sitting at a university, uh, and just to switch here just a little bit, what has the role of climate and environmental justice been in shaping climate policy? So especially thinking about student activism, but what what impact has that had on climate policy? <laughs> um so okay, well again, I don't I don't I would love to hear uh, if audience members have thoughts on this particular question, I would love your own insights. My sense is that the the climate justice is incredibly important, and in particular contexts, like um, Stephanie was just saying, it it is a central piece of the discourse, but that overall it has had sort of a disappointingly marginal effect uh, and role in the debate. Um, So then, so why do we not care about justice or climate justice, um, uh, environmental justice more generally? And I have my own hypotheses about why that's true. I think um, so this is where I'm veering off of any sort of formal expertise and into just informed speculation. So know that. But um, first of all, justice is hard. That is equity in a serious sense is is in, is difficult to achieve. Second of all, there's a strong support of equality of opportunity in American politics, but not necessarily equality of outcomes. And justice is linked in any meaningful way. It needs to be linked to outcomes not just opportunities. Um, if we actually want sort of a more egalitarian world where just that is more just in a serious sense. Um, and then finally, um, those who are most apt to advocate for justice, though, that is those who experience injustice often have the lowest levels of political power and influence, right? Which is a simple uh, structural problem. And that means that they have less uh, capacity to influence the debate. So, those are informed points of speculation, not empirical facts, but I think that these they give you a starting point for trying to explain why, at least in my view, climate justice has not shaped the, the policy debate around climate change as much as we might hope. I'll, I'll add a little bit, coming back again to the Inflation Reduction Act, just to think about how that passed. So we, we you know, the, the headlines will talk about the role of Senator Manchin being wooed onto the, um, to the passing side. 
Um, but it's also true that climate justice and environmental justice organizations were critical to the passage of that bill. Um, if they, if they um, had not engaged from the beginning in demanding that the federal government act on climate, first of all, and I would include the student, um, student climate movements in that umbrella as well. It was a, a chorus of demands rising up to this administration that says you cannot squander this opportunity for advancing broad federal climate legislation. So I think that's a, an important role for student activism and engagement at, at the national level and, and the Environmental Justice and Climate Justice Coalition in particular. So um, they're increasingly organized in, in thinking about their role in shaping the outcomes of big federal elections, including this one right now. And in terms of their work with the Inflation Reduction Act, um, they were at the, at the table as this bill was being developed and um, pressed all that they could as hard as they could for what they would define as an acceptable level of investments in environmental justice communities. And so that did translate into tens of billions of dollars that were targeted, earmarked towards frontline and environmental justice communities, uh, specifically those who have um, uh, been historically harmed by fossil fuel infrastructure um, and fossil fuel, um, other environmental related consequences of that. And so um, that was what they felt they could 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 push into that bill and and still um, get it passed in a highly politicized environment. But without that coalition pushing their elected officials to keep the coalition together to move the bill forward, it, it would not it would have failed. So I just want to make that like historical footnote. Yes, Manchin, but also um, the critical role of EJ and climate justice communities in getting that done. So. What does that mean going forward? That does mean that there is an increasingly important role um, on the accountability side, but also on the engagement side for thinking about how climate action shows up at all levels. And I would call that even true here at, at Brown, right? Um, the role of the students have had in, in pressuring what is um, industry leading carbon action goals here at Brown um, is, is a, 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 a fact of history. And the role that students will continue to have in thinking about what's the next frontier for Brown on climate action um, is going to also be written into history books. So that's to, to the students in the room and also to the faculty who are thinking about how we are working on that engagement um, to advance the next frontier here at Brown. But also just giving, giving props where they're due to the broader movements that have coalesced and I know will continue to push whatever next administration lands um, on this issue, rightly so. It's a good point. Thank you. Um, I was hoping we could talk maybe a little bit about modes of communication. I think it's pretty clear that like today, everyone's addicted to, to technology. We're in like an attention economy. And we have like one of the most popular methods of information out there that's owned by someone who is very clearly on one side of the aisle, um, you know, rallying with specific candidates, even though they happen to be a major produ producer of electric vehicles. Um, so how would you say we improve communication? What are the best methods of communication to get the messages that like you would want to get across to as many people as possible, but more specifically the people, unlike probably most of the people here who really need to hear the specific information um, in a way where, you know, for the most part, like, People watch specific news networks. They read specific stories. You see something, and you know people just by looking at the source. Look, like, I'm not reading this. It's like already leaning one way or the other. So, how would you say we need to improve communication about this to get to as many people as possible um, in today's day and age? That seems like a question for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for the question. The list is long. Um, Maybe a good place to start is um, if we think back to this example of the research we just published, and I encourage you, if you just go to the Information Futures Lab at Brown uh, website, it's the first news item on the site, click into the report. Um, we found that out of the, cli again, climate and health-related content, 11% uh, of that content was contrarian content. However... YouTube has a policy that prohibits ads and monetization from content that directly contradicts the scientific consensus on climate change. What was the percentage of uh, contrarian content on YouTube? Less than 5%. What was the percentage of contrarian content on Twitter slash X? Any guesses? 
25%. So every fourth post on the platform was more, and, and, and at this point, so again, we just did then a lot of qualitative work to also better understand what is happening there. What's happening there is uh, the denying that the mental health impact is, is real and like uh, um, elites are like torturing their children by, you know, creating climate depression, those types of things. Um, so I think the, the important answer to your question is um, that there are multiple solutions. Obviously, it's a complex problem, so there isn't just one solution. Uh, but platform policies matter, just as climate policies matter. And uh, thinking about it um, in not in a form of the, the way that the platform conversation currently unfolds is around censorship. So um, uh, there has been an active effort to try to um, um, make any attempt to moderate content online look like uh, free speech is being censored. When the better tools that we, it's not about who, what is this misinformation and how can we delete the post that would take away the right of the individual person to post their content. What's much more important as a solution is, can you monetize it if it's factually wrong, right? There's lots of other tools. Do I, as a user, have the ability to toggle what I want to see and not? So there's a whole set of solutions that sit in how we as users interact with content online. Uh, that we have to have a lot more conversations about because they are essential to solving our really important problems. However, what's also really important is in the report actually lists a number of strategies and things we can do right now. Changing platform policy is going to take time, but there are things we can do today. One is make that connection to health in our climate work and climate communications. Another is we saw almost no storytelling. Storytelling is the number one tool to get people engaged at an emotional level. We all have an emotional relationship with information. That's why we're clicking around on these platforms. But as communicators, we're not using this practice by far often enough. We're not talking about the, the benefits to health if we, if we take these actions. So there's a, there's a list of concrete like strategies for how to engage. And then the last one just for today is offline. A lot of this work actually happens offline where we come together as people and have conversations and get engaged in community. So some of what we're finding in our work also is it's very easy to get really upset about some outrageous disinformation content. But to some extent, that has become entertainment. As you know, problematic as that is, it doesn't necessarily mean that people are buying into it. And that's also really important. We need to focus on where people's con conceptions about these things are being changed. And we can only do that at the local level. And for example, we, we did this work with Spanish-speaking communities in, in South Florida, where uh, we could see um, that out of all the questions that they asked, they were around 10% uh, of the questions were around environment and climate-related questions. But only a small number of those were related to misinformation and disinformation. A large number of the questions were related to uh, uh, practical questions in their lives, like how do I get insurance for my house in a state like Florida, where you know we're the front line of climate change, or we have another storm. What about the flooding? Like all those types of things. So uh, another solution here is that we need to think deeply about the inequities that exist in our information ecosystem where some people have access to, to good information and other people don't, and that limits their choices. There's a question in the front, I think, right? Yeah. Yep. Thank you guys so much for being here. I, I have a question that is on a slightly different uh, scope, but with the international communities, what have we been seeing with the candidates and the campaigns and their conversations around international climate intervention and what can we expect with the outcomes of this election in the international climate debate? So it's a pretty broad question, but what are we thinking about, especially with Europe just recently having kind of more of a blue or green wave? Um, and so there are some changing uh, some changing viewpoints coming from other points in the world. And how is that affecting our elections now and the outcomes of our elections? Yeah. So there's that look again, right? <laughs> um, um, gosh, you know, I I'm trying I'm trying to find like the the hopeful kernel that's not just basically what happens in in a, in a month will de decide the answer to your question. Um, 
I, I think is the short answer. I mean, I, I think we know, I think we're all, I think we have a strong sense of how Trump will lead on climate, if we would call it leading on climate, if he is elected again, right? So I would expect a repeat. I guess the kernel of op uh, optimism for somebody who wants to, who is concerned about climate action in that context is that there's a lot of room for action in the private sector and international internationally, right, to continue to move forward. Um, I would expect governors across the United States to take action to help lead globally in the American context in the absence of a presidential leadership and so on. Um, I don't think if your question was how international politics and, and p patterns and elections might influence the outcome of the American election, I'm not I don't have an answer to that. And I don't think that there's going to be a direct, a clear direct linkage. On the other hand, I think there's a big question mark on how aggressive a Harris Walsh administration will be on climate, precisely because they're not talking about it. Um, and this goes back to Kim's point about movements um, and the incredible importance of pressure. Um, uh, climate activists, those of us who care about climate, will be caught on our back foot if the Trump administration wins the election, and there'll be a lot of um, defensive work, essentially, that needs to be done, as there was in 2016 through that administration. Um, if the outcome is different, if the presidential outcome is different, then you have, broadly speaking, probably a climate ally in the White House, which actually opens opportunities for making progress and makes pressure um, sort of a proactive, if you want pressure and less defensive work, uh, political work, even more important, right? Um, cue the importance of the uh, EJ movement and passage of the IRA and similar things, right? So that's not a direct question to the international sphere, except to say that I think that A, the international influence on the American election is going to be minimal and B, how the US leads or doesn't lead is basically going to be contingent on the outcome of the election. So, but I would say one more thing about China, right? In terms of the international context, I think that, you know, this kind of goes back to the question you were asking about talking points um, that are relevant to our kind of international landscape right now. And looking at the role of China in, in subsidizing their clean energy economy um, and leaning into what they hope will be the global leadership role on climate um, in, in the next whatever administration lands, right? Uh, that's where they're going because it's very clear that they have a lot to gain from that. And so I think some of the talking points that we could borrow are, are around American competitiveness and our uh, economic positioning, our national security positioning in a warming world. Because they're leaning into that science and leaning into that opportunity space. And we are, you know, with the Inflation Reduction Act is the first lean in we have done. But we are behind um, the investments that China has already made and are going to continue to make. So I think that that's an important note about where this next four, the importance of this next four years in that um, really key uh, positioning of America in the 21st century. And I think that's important to keep in mind and also a good talking point for folks who don't necessarily um, vote on the Democratic side. Great example of a framing that is more inclusive. Uh, there's a question, right? Um, just a quick question. Um, climate change, we were saying, is not really big on anyone's list of priorities. However, we have the hurricanes that are going on now, the hurricanes in the past, the tornadoes in the Midwest, um, the wildfires in the West, soaring insurance costs. People don't care until it actually affects them and affects their wallets, like the grocery price of the groceries. With these rising insurance costs, could that be something that could be a catalyst for change? Where now all of a sudden, they're going to say, wow, I can't afford the insurance of my condo or house in Florida, we need to do something about this. Could that actually be some type of momentum or catalyst to get some change for climate change and dealing with this and resiliency or anything else? I'll take a little bit of a stab there. Um, I think it, it was a couple of years ago when whole companies started pulling out of whole states for the first time, citing climate risk to their portfolio and their solvency. And so that happened, I forget the company in California over wildfires. And, and again, I forget the company in Florida over, um, over the, the storms. And so that was a bellwether moment for me as a climate scientist, because this is exactly what's going to happen. This is how it's going to go down. 
Another concrete example that kind of speaks to the complexities more, that was a, a simple thing of like the insurance companies and the process of rewriting risk equations, and they still are um, underestimating dramatically the risk to their portfolio um, based on the available science. But, but what we know from an example from Hurricane Sandy is kind of a grim cautionary note of the power of that instrument to, to move us forward, because what happened was you know, overnight, the insurance company said, oh, you know, we've under underestimated risk here. We're going to jack up insurance rates. And then the um, the policymakers said, oh, no, you don't. Right. And so they, they capped insurance rates um, very low and they are only allowed to crawl up a certain amount. And, you know, we can all understand why. That's because you're leaving high and dry homeowners who um, put their trust in an in insurance company and and have a stake their whole livelihood tied up in their house in that asset, right? And, and what are you going to do? Mass migrate the entire Jersey Shore overnight, um, price people out of their homes and make them worthless overnight. Um, so this is, this is the grind of structural change that is underway right now. And I would think it's going to take decades to stabilize what you might consider a market mechanism in the face of the catastrophic and generational losses that people are experiencing this week with Helene, Milton, but with any given climate-related catastrophe that you just cited, um, this is a slow-moving train wreck, um, perhaps more than it is an instrument of solutions making. If I can follow up on that, what Florida did when Allianz and others moved out, there's only two insurers left in the state, was to create a backup option. The idea was that if um, people did not have any commercial options for their uh, insurance that this publicly funded option would uh, uh, come in instead. Uh, it's now that almost 50% of homeowners in the state of Florida are covered by the public option. That means taxpayers are already paying for it. So I think that's a really important point. And what I love about your question is um, we need to focus on how people are feeling it in their daily lives. So one thing we found, we did an assessment here of how a Rhode Islander is talking about climate and health. Just again, in online spaces, if we do the social listening, we can actually learn a lot. So naturally, people aren't talking about climate change and health in those terms. But you could see, for example, a rise in online conversations around the rise in electricity bills due to needing the, to run the AC so much more, which is how we protect ourselves uh, during a prolonged heat waves. And those are the levers. A, we need to help people with their electricity bills, right? That's important. But can we also say, you know, you might be in a state where you have a choice to actually get your source of energy, to change your source of energy for how you, you know, the electricity that you use or how you pay for it. Those are sort of direct connections and we need to understand them a lot better. Um, and again, I, I, I really appreciate the cautionary tale, but I think it's an important avenue for us to think about solutions because we, and, and we also owe it to people because otherwise our, our adaptation measures will not be apt if we don't know how it's actually um, uh, working out on the ground. One One quick plug in relation to your question, not of my own work, but of an economic and environmental sociologist of the London School of Economics, Rebecca Elliott, has written a wonderful book called Underwater about flood insurance and attempting to sort of understand the politics of climate change as the politics of loss. So I highly recommend her work to those of you who are interested in this particular question and how climate change is, sh is creating a sort of new way of understanding action um, in relation to the losses that people experience in relation to these kinds of uh, disasters climate disaster specifically. Thank you so much for that. We are, we're at time. If you didn't, if you had a question but didn't get it answered, please feel free to come up. Um, big thanks to our panelists. Big thanks to Katie Silberman, the IBIS team, and Watson, Catherine Dunkelman here at Watson as well. Thank you so much. This is a terrific panel um, and have a great afternoon. But thank you, Perry, as well.